Well, let's jump to volcanoes. Seth uh, did a nice introduction of uh, Mount St. Helens. Many of you were probably around then and remember a lot of the, the whoop de doo that went on with this. So I'm going to quickly run through that, that scenario that illustrates how a predictions can be made. It started, uh, says said, on March 20th, 1980, just over 30 years ago, uh, with a magnitude 4 approximately earthquake. And very shortly thereafter, the seismicity really picked up. Now, the first earthquake got our attention, but we didn't generate predictions based on it. Now, this is a, what's called a, a helicorder record, and you'll see a few records like these. There's seismograms, and they're a recording of the earth motion at a seismic station, in this case, one located on the west flank of St. Helens. And you read it more or less like a book, that as time increases left to right and top to bottom. And the very regular ticks there are minute marks, and the sort of random blurry things there are actually earthquakes. And these are relatively small volcanic earthquakes that were taking place in the vicinity of this station. And I think it's pretty obvious that from the top of this, March 22nd through the uh, 23rd, that there's an increasing number of these. Okay, this is not rocket science. Uh, we saw this, and particularly over the next couple of days, uh, it, it, it got our attention really significantly. Uh, not only did the station we were monitoring became so active we couldn't really distinguish one event from another, so we switched to a more distant station, and still the activity was, was really tremendous. Well, what do you do? Uh, you predict an eruption. And so in consultation with the USGS volcano hazards expert, who, who were actually from, from Denver, that's where they were based at that time, uh, and talking with the Forest Service, the land managers, we actually issued a prediction on Wednesday, uh, the 26th. And so it came out in the newspaper the next day. Uh, I was younger, 30 years ago. Uh, and you notice that the, the soon in this case is in quotes. Okay, this is not a, a geology publication. This is the Seattle PI. So it's not geologically soon, but rather in human terms, in days. And indeed, the next day, in fact, later the same day, the day after we made the prediction, uh, the volcano did erupt for the first time and got everyone's attention. So the seismologists were sort of off the hook because the dirt was coming out of, the, out of the top. And lots of geologists, volcanologists, uh, came to the region to study this and to try to anticipate what was happening. Now, the, the, the earthquake activity continued. These small eruptions uh, started off fairly small. Uh, they continued off and on, uh, but more or less continuously for the next two months until May 18th, uh, when uh, without any changes in this activity in the immediate hours to days ahead of time, suddenly the north side of the mountain uh, failed and it uncorked the, the, the magma system, the molten rock that was gas charged that had been arriving into the volcano and generated this blast cloud that, that uh, spewed out to the north, traveled uh, over 30 kilometers in that way, pretty much laying waste to the countryside, and unfortunately there were 57 fatalities. Well, was this a successful prediction? Uh, no. Well, a little bit. No in that it was not anticipated in that socially useful time scale of hours to a day ahead of time, nor the size. But again, at the same time, a large area around the volcano had been evacuated, and there was a lot of public pressure to let people back in, the tourists and the loggers, etc. And so certainly the, the death toll was far less uh, than, it could, than it might have been had there not been some type of issue about how dangerous the situation was. Well, that uh, um, was sort of the big event. That was the big one. And specifically, it was not predicted on that socially useful time scale. Following that, there were a number of other eruptions. In fact, over the next six years, there were probably about 20 of which most of those we did learn to anticipate in that socially useful time scale of hours to days. And again, it was primarily done by using seismology. Um, 
a record of, of earthquakes before one of them, in this case, changes in its character, uh, the number of events, and we learned that if you just calculate the energy release during these and plot that over time, as you see this plot go, it will tick up as you approach an eruption. And we use those curves pretty much in a routine-like way to indicate when the volcano was going to erupt. And as I say, this was fairly successful. And in the early parts, in the summer of 1980, with explosive eruptions, they were some hours ahead of time. Later on, they would become more um, um, spread out, and you could anticipate the, uh, the eruption sometimes days to even a few weeks ahead of time. Well, in, uh, by 1986, St. Helens had sort of gone back to sleep. Uh, there were a few minor steam explosions now and then after that, and there were earthquakes that continued, but they didn't have the patterns that we had recognized previously. There was a lava dome that had grown in the crater at that point, and it was sort of steaming, but pretty much the volcano was quiet for the next 18 years. Then in 2004, again, we see this pattern of of uh, increasing seismicity. Pretty much started from almost nothing and built up within a few days until it was again quite obvious that something had changed. And again, the, uh, the, the, a, a prediction was made in a sense. Uh, the warning was raised. Uh, we said within days something would occur and likely it would not be terribly big. We understood at this time that the geometry at St. Helens was such that it was highly unlikely that you would have a really large eruption. You always sort of put in some caveats about that. Uh, it's possible, but likely we think this is what it'll be. And indeed, that's pretty much then what happened. Uh, a few days later, there was a nice steam explosion that uh, generated some problems in the crater and actually scared Seth Moran to pieces because he was just down the slope from the volcano working on a seismic station and decided this was not a healthy place to, to be. Even though he wasn't in danger, it, this type of thing could uh, get your adrenaline going, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, um, so again, the same process occurred. So we've got some, some history in being able to, to uh, understand uh, these Putting that together with some studies at other volcanoes, in particular ones that we worked on in, in Russia, Bizimyani volcano, and looking at the amount of energy that is released in this precursory period versus how long the volcano has been asleep, there seemed to be some sort of pattern. So if the volcano is in repose, that is not erupting, for a long period of time, the amount of seismic energy that will be released is greater than if it's only been asleep for maybe a month or two. So this may give us a handle in the future if it plays out at a number of other types of volcanoes. And there's a hint that it may in Alaska, but with somewhat of a different relationship. This is very early work that, in fact, uh, has just now been submitted for publication. So it's, uh, it's early in the, in the story. Well, since the, the days of, of Mount St. Helens in the 1980s, there have been many other places around the world in which volcano prediction has been very useful, socially useful in the sense that people were evacuated from the hazardous areas uh, and um, certainly while lives in some cases were lost, far fewer than had um, you know, this type of prediction technology and science progressed to where it is now. Well, I, I had to throw in a, uh, a current event, since this is certainly in the news all the time. Uh, and here we go. We're going to pronounce the name of the Icelandic volcano here, but um, I probably won't get it right. Uh, well, maybe not. I'll, I'll get an Icelander to help me out. Uh, very few people can do it. And I certainly can. <laughs> anyway, this has generated a lot of uh, a lot of hassle lately, and um, uh, many of well, a number of the participants in the Seismological Society of America meeting that's starting actually this evening for the next three days have not been able to get here. Even though it's the SS America, there are many foreign uh, scientists that attend this uh, this meeting, and they're stuck in Europe. 